for the next 60 days, for eight weeks, uh, I'm going to challenge you to be the best spirit-driven, God-blessed person that you can be. Piece of cake, right? You can do that. You do that just by waking up every morning. I want you to exhibit to whatever degree is possible within you and in your life the, the hope that, uh, that, that is written in two-foot-tall letters outside on that wall. It needs to be more than just the name of, of the church. It needs to be more than just uh, what, what, we, what we call ourselves. It needs to be who we are. We didn't, we didn't elect that name. We didn't go through the process of the dozen or so names that we whittled down, and that one just made its way to the top. Uh, it made its way to the top because I think it best represents who we are. So our challenge going forward is to be that hope, is to show what, what it means to be um, uh, hopeful, that is full of hope. What it means to be hopeful to those who are hope less to those who are missing some component of hope or are without hope at all. We think about the young ladies who find themselves in a difficult situation being pregnant. That can often, often be a situation where hope vanishes. You know, if you're 14, 15, 16, 18, 30, whatever, and you were not expecting this joy to come along in your life, that could turn your entire life upside down. And hope, hope for anything beyond today can be in short supply. But God has placed us here in this world, that is, you and I as Christ followers here in this world, to be that hope, to be overflowing with hope for those who are hopeless, for those who need to find hope, who need to see hope, who need to experience some hope. So our challenge in, in being these people of hope is to take the fruit that God vests in each one of his people. Every one of you, every one of you who is a Christ follower has some component of God's fruit, fruit of the Spirit within you. Now, it may just be in seed form right now. It may not be developed at all, or it may be just a tiny little seedling of fruit. But there is some measure of fruit in your life. And so our challenge, week by week, for the next eight weeks, is to examine what the Bible has to say about each one of these fruits. Now, you're recognizing what's up here. Uh, as it, it, it comes from Galatians chapter 5 and 22, right? The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There's a big and there to get to the last words there. And so each of these, what Paul was writing is that each one of these is evident to some degree in your life. All of them may not be evident, one, you, you may be just positively overflowing with peace and struggle with self-control, for example. And that's okay. It's there. You just need to nourish it and grow it. Now, I got a question for you. See that thing up there? What is that? You're all from Idaho, so I know you don't know what that is, right? What? A lime, okay. It looks sort of like a lime, except it's kind of round. Anybody else? Am I only a person from LA here? Is it okay? Believe it or not, that is an orange. Now, how come you didn't guess orange right away? Come on, I looked at it and said, "Boom, orange." In fact, that is an orange in my mom's backyard. Who cares, right? Okay, so this is an orange. The reason you didn't say it's an orange is because it ain't orange, right? Our brain says orange is whatever. Orange. Nobody's wearing orange today. Okay. An orange should be orange. And that triggers something in our head that says, oh, I know what this tastes like. I know when I crack it open, the juice is going to get all over. I, I know all these things. 
But see, the thing is, that is a juicy orange. It'd be a little sour at this point and not orange at all, but that's an orange. But your brain says it's the wrong color. It's the wrong color for an orange. The joy, the peace, the patience, all these things may be in you right now. They may be present in you, but you just don't see them yet. You don't recognize them because you're looking for a patience that matches whatever definition of patience you have in your mind. You're looking for a goodness that matches whatever picture you have of goodness in your mind. And so you don't see the goodness that's in this form. But the fruit of God working in your spirit is there. The fruit of God at work in your spirit is there in some state. And the challenge that we have, again, is to nurture that, is to, is to look for that seed, is to water it, is to fertilize it, is to, to nurture that little seedling along. And even when it grows to this, to this point, this is a full-size orange here, it's just not ripe. And you look at that and go, that that's, it must be a lime or it must be something else. Don't be fooled. That is what you think it is. It just needs to fully blossom here. And so some of us, some of us have the fruit of the Spirit in us that is at this point. It's fully developed. It's right there. It's just just not ripened yet. It's just not fully formed yet to where everybody can see it. But boy, when it ripens, how good is that orange going to be? Huh? You can taste it, can't you? You can taste the best orange you have ever had that comes up. And the fruit is the same way. The seeds, the seedlings, the fully formed fruit of the Spirit is in us. And we need to take care of it. We need to nurture it and make it come out. And you're saying, why? Why do we have to do this? Well, we have to do this because each one of those things is a component of hope. Hope is composed of all those things. You see, the hopeless in this world suffer from a lack of joy. The hopeless in this world have no shalom. They need that peace. The hopeless are impatient. They are unkind. They need these things. And the only place they're going to see them in this world, on this side of eternity, is from you. The only place that the world, the world out there, is going to see any of these things the way that God intends them is if you put them on display. Is if you nurture that fruit, ripen it up, and just positively overflow with whatever these things are. Okay? Now, I know one of the mathematicians out there amongst us, Amy's probably already tallied this up, and she said, you said eight weeks, but there are nine things up there on that list. Hi, Amy, that's what she, I, I saw her, she's wearing an orange dress, I found the orange, right? Yeah, there are, there are nine things up there, but listen, the way the fruit of the Spirit works is that they all start with love. Okay? When Paul gives this list of fruit, when he says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, joy and peace and patience and kindness all derive from love. Love is just the ground in which the fruit is nurtured. Love is, is the environment in which any of these things grow. None of these things can exist in your life without love and not not the emotional love not not oh my heart beats for you kind of love no the love that comes from your realization that God loved you so much that he gave his son for you that's that's the baseline love when when that realization becomes a part of who you are only then does joy and peace patience and kindness begin to sprout. You can't have peace, can't have peace, biblical peace, without loving Jesus and without realizing how much he loves you back. It's impossible. Now, you can have worldly peace, which is just basically you and me are not tussling, that's, you know, but that's not the shalom that God intends. 
You cannot be biblically faithful and kind and gentle unless you first love. And so this fruit, as we examine it each week, we understand that the love forms the, the ground, the environment in which this stuff grows. And so each week we will begin by examining one of these fruits and see what the Bible tells us about how we can have more of it, how we can grow stronger in that particular fruit. And I think logically we probably ought to start with joy. 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 Joy is a tough one for me, and I think I've shared this with you before because one of my brothers years ago confronted me with this. His name was Jin Lim, and he says, you know what, Pastor, you got a problem. And I said, well, you got a funny name, so therefore, you know. no, I didn't say that because Jin was a super nice guy who exhibited every bit of the fruit of the Spirit. And he says, you know, I don't see any joy in your life. And I said, I am positively brimming with joy. I'm filthy with it, man. And he said, no, 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 no. He says, he says you're putting on this, this face. He says, you're putting on this act at, at being joyful, but it doesn't mark who you are. And so I've worked since that day. That probably 10 years ago he told me that. I've worked since then to just let this joy come out, to know this joy of just simply being a beloved son of God and realizing that really there's nothing else you need after that. There, there, is no other, there is no other marker that you need. So joy is, is one of those things that can get confused with the emotion of joy, right? The emotion of joy is up, down, up, down, up, down. It depends on the circumstance. So if everything's going great, man, you are filled with joy. You are as joyful as can be. But as soon as things get you know, into that negative one territory below the line there, your joy, your joy begins to wander off, doesn't it? It's like one of Ken's cows. It begins to just find its way into another pasture there. Your joy, emotional joy, is completely dependent on what's going on around you. Things are good, you're joyful. Things not good, tough luck. No joy for you today. But biblical joy says you are joyful despite your circumstance. You can be joyful despite everything that's going on around you. Turn to the book of Philippians. And I'll tell you what, you may not realize it, but this is a book of joy. This entire book is brimming with joy. And what makes it so uh, applicable to what we're talking about this morning is that this is joy despite this is joy despite everything that's going on. Look at, look at what's going on with Paul, the author of the letter, and the church at Philippi. First of all, Paul's in prison. He's writing this letter from prison. Now, all the time I did in prison, I wasn't... No, I'm just kidding, okay, before you get that started. But, you know, he's, he's, his liberty has been taken away. And, and prison is not like the prison of today. This is like some dank cellar somewhere and you're chained up all day long in your own whatever and the rats are walking out. So there's, there's no avenue for joy there and yet every time we see Paul in prison, what's he doing? He's singing hymns and he's, and he's sharing Jesus with the jailers. And so he, he has this joy despite his circumstance, despite you know, the shipwrecks that he's in, despite him being naked and clothed, despite him being hot, it doesn't matter to him. Circumstances play no role in his joy. And so the author is now writing to a church that is being persecuted. And the church at Philippi, um, you know, it's, it's just sort of a church that's there, but they, the Judaizers, these guys who said, you can't be a Christian until you've been a Jew first, they've come along and begun to impose their, their rules on everybody in Philippi, and they're stirring things up. And some other false teachers are coming into town and, and giving some, just all kind of bad things are going on here. So the church is a little bit downcast. 
like Paul, you're in prison. We really need your help. We need you to, to be here. And Paul says, well, duh, I'm in prison. I can't come there. And he says, but listen, none of that matters. He says, I don't, I don't care about these guys that are coming along and they're teaching in order to, to get their own fame or to get money or to get whatever. He says, I don't care. As long as the gospel's being preached, doesn't matter who's doing it. It could be me, it could be any of these teachers. He says, so ignore them. He says, I'm in prison. So what? I'm in prison. Jesus still loves me whether I'm in prison or there in Philippi. It doesn't matter. And it's the same for you. The Judaizers, they're going to come, they're going to go. Somebody else will replace them in this world. It doesn't matter. Now, we've read Philippians 2, I don't know how many times, right? Make my joy complete by... And he says, listen, in chapter 4, and I'm going to start in verse 4 here. He gives some more imperatives. Rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. And the God of peace will be with you. Wow. Rejoice always. he's, He's giving us the recipe for joy here. He says, listen, I'm in prison and I'm rejoicing. You're being attacked and persecuted. Rejoice. Give thanks that you're being persecuted. Give thanks that God has seen you worthy of being persecuted. Rejoice that these false teachers are coming into town because they're preaching the gospel. Rejoice that I'm in prison. Rejoice always. Now, always means always. It doesn't mean only when things are good or or when things are just average. It means even when they're awful. Rejoice. Rejoice because you are above all these things. Yeah, you know, people who are rooted in today, people that are living in this moment, up, down, up, down, up, down, it's going to be tough to rejoice always because they're looking for the next down. And so they're 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 going to temper their joy. He says, you don't have any of that. He says, you will rejoice always because you're nothing but up. You're just, you're constantly on the up until the end of time. And then it starts over. When the end of this time is done, your eternity begins. So rejoice, rejoice always. And then he says, don't be anxious. Don't be anxious because what he said in the previous sentence, the Lord is near. He says, listen, if you're, if you're looking at your circumstances, if you're looking at the things that are going on around you and you're constantly worried, you're certainly not going to be joyful. If you're constantly tied up in knot because you don't know what's going to happen in the election or you don't know if more Judaizers are going to come into town or you don't know blah, 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 blah. He says, what are you worried about that for? God is near. God has entered this plane of existence. Jesus has come and died and rose again. What in the world are you concerned about? He says the Lord is near. The Spirit lives within you. So seriously, what are you worried about? Why are you so concerned about what happens tomorrow? It doesn't matter what happens tomorrow. God has everything under control. Rejoice always. Don't be anxious. He says, listen, the Lord is near and you have been privileged to be able to take your prayers directly to God. 
for us being you know a couple thousand years removed uh, that's not such a big thing but listen if you were in the first century and your previous experience with God was you had to go to the temple and you had to kill something and then only the high priest could access God this was a big deal for you now God is not behind that curtain any longer God is here right now in this room sitting on that bench next to you God is right here today now and and you don't have to go to the priest anymore you don't have to take seven pigeons anymore you don't have to do anything you want to communicate with God talk say what you want to say give him your praises bring your petitions to him Share the entirety of your life with him because he's right there. He's right there next to you. And you're anxious? God is right there. The God of all the universe is right there next to you. And you are anxious. Rejoice always. Rejoice always. And he says, listen, listen. He gives that that great line in verse 7, and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. A wonderful promise. But look at what he says in the very next verse because I I think this is what benefits you and me the most. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything... If anything, anything, underline that, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Now, you and I being good Christians, we take that and we superimpose it on the Bible as though the only things that are good and beautiful and admirable and right and lovely and all the other adjectives that he uses exists in this book. Here's what Paul's actually saying. Paul is saying, lift your eyes up and look around. This world belongs to God. This world was created by God. That person who's annoying you was created by God. The person sitting on the bench next to you possesses the image of God. That person that you're going to run into here at the stop sign out here is in the image of God. He says, listen, lift your eyes up. There are things outside of what you read about in this book that are pure and lovely and good and beneficial. Lift your eyes up and find where God is in those things. You see, what happens to Christians, what we have done over the, over the past hundred years, we're, we're at our worst in this, is we've taken this sanctuary mentality to the nth degree. We're all, we're all safe and cozy and happy here inside this room. And then we look outside as though Satan himself is strolling the sidewalk waiting for you to come out. And he may be, but who cares? That's okay. Because who's near you? God is near you. Listen, the thing is, if we look only in this room and in this family and in the things that we do as the only things that are good and pure and lovely, we miss out on things that are going to contribute to our joy and we're going to miss out on opportunities to share our joy with other people. So Paul says, lift your eyes up. This is God's world. While Satan may be the prince of this world for a time, the world does not belong to him. And the people in this world do not belong to him. And the beauty of the mountains and the ocean and everything else does not belong to him. It all belongs to God. So lift your eyes up. Even though it may be sullied by this world, all of it belongs to God. And then he says, whatever you've learned from me, whatever you see in me, do it. However you see me rejoice, however you see me show love and peace and patience, do it. It's just that simple. And I think if we were going to, if we were going to take a verse from this little passage here and apply it to ourselves, I would say that belongs to us. 
That applies to us. That should be what we pray every day. Let me be a model of joy. You know, when my brother confronted me about my, my lack of showing joy, he, he wasn't scolding me simply because he wanted me to be a different way. What he was saying is, you have a responsibility. You, have an account, you are accountable to all the other brothers and sisters to show joy so that if someone else is struggling to have their joy, if someone is struggling to nurture that joy, they can see it in you. That's why he was telling me that I need to, to, uh, to show more joy in my life. So I took the challenge, and the challenge is for all of us. The challenge for the next eight weeks, eight However, eight weeks, okay, eight weeks is to nurture these fruits within us because it's love and joy that makes hope. It's love and peace. It's love and that shalom that makes hope. It's that love and patience, and you can go down the rest of the list, that shows hope to the hopeless in this world. Now, here's the thing about this challenge. Okay? This challenge is just all over the place for everybody, and it will be for every one of these fruits. Because some of us, some of us are just positively gushing with joy. I'm not going to name names, Rick, but you know, just positively gushing with joy. And while at the same time, some of the rest of us are maybe struggling to show joy. So the challenge is different for every single one of us, right? The challenge is different for every single one of us. But here's what I want you to do. I forgot what I want. No. <laughs> what I want you to do, I want you to ask this question every day this week. First thing when you get up, not what's for breakfast, but who am I? How convenient that we sang that song today, huh? Who am I? Who am I that the Lord of all... No, forget the rest of the song, but who am I? And, and I don't want you to answer in terms of your name, who your parents are, what your job is, and none of that stuff matters, okay? I want you to ask God, who am I? Who am, and let him tell you who you are. If you take a little card, a little whatever, three by five card, write that across, who am I? And then go to the Bible and let God show you who you are. Everything that he shows you, everything that, that he shows to each of us individually will be a source of joy in your life, okay? So let's say he takes you to uh, John chapter one, verse 12 right? That you are a son or a daughter of God. Bam, right there. That alone can be the source of eternal joy. The fact that you are not Romans 5, uh, uh, 8. You are not an enemy of God any longer. You are now a son or daughter of God there's your source of joy right there. So if you're gushing with joy, you already know that and you're fulfilled there. But if you're struggling to just show just a little seedling, if you're struggling just to get that thing to germinate, that may be what you need. Now, I'm not saying that's your verse. See, here's the thing about this challenge. It's, it, it, I can't come up here each week and say, okay, verse John 1.12 blanket for everybody because everybody's not at the same place so you're going to have to do some work that's part of the challenge you're going to have to do some work and let God show you who you are because once you know who you are your joy will begin to show and maybe in the green stage of being an orange but your joy will begin to show and here's what this will do for you later on once you know who you are, once that joy germinates and you're nurturing it along, every time something comes along in your life that threatens to steal your joy or squash it or, or make it crawl back into its hole or whatever, you can pull this card out 
and say, well, I'm mad because Rick plays golf better than me, but I am a son of God, so therefore, therefore, I'm filled with joy. This will be something that, that you can hang on to. Listen, all these things here, as I just said, these form the foundation for hope. And hope is what we're all about. Being hopeful for the hopeless is why that word is in such big letters out there on the side of the building. To truly know that you and I are loved by God, to truly know that you and I are the sons and daughters of God, is just very simply to have hope. That's what causes hope within us. If we know that joy, if we know the joy of being that son or daughter of God, if we we know that, we have that joy, despite all the things that go on around us, that will begin to show in our life. That will begin to, people will see it. People see, will see that, yeah, despite the fact that A, A, B, and C is going on, you're still happy, you're still joyful, you're still, and, and you can say, yeah, because I am a son or a daughter of God. And to have joy is to have hope. And to have hope is to be what we are called to be. And so I say to you, hopeful, take Take this challenge. Take the challenge. Let God speak to you through these things. Let God speak to you through these little bits of the Bible. And when you do, when, when, we, when we find our joy and our peace and our patience, we will so, so overflow with hope. I mean, it will just be brimming out of us. So much so that it's going to get all over everybody and everything that we come in contact with. There'll be hope everywhere. People will be covered from head to toe with hope. So shall we be hopeful for the hopeless? Amen. I agree. Let's pray.